George, do you know if Elizabeth is going to be on the call? She plans to. Hello, all. Mike's here. Hello, hey, Council Member Memphis. Oh, Just to keep you in the loop, so the council are all going to be made co-hosts, so that way you can control your muting and unmuting. All other guests are going to be muted, and that's to make sure that if they want to do any public comment, they have to kind of follow our, our instructions. So you'll be able to use those features, but you won't now have the option to use the hand raise, I think, so just be mindful of that. Cool. Um, Chief, will will Joe be presenting? Sorry, no, he won't. Okay. Hey, Mike, we have your photo. Yeah, I'll probably flip it off at some point. This is my, uh, I got my after shirt on. I see that. Sam, you're official. I am feeling very, what's the word for not patriotic, but cityotic, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> very representative. I put mine on too, Mike. Oh, look at that. We're twins. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I got I got it. I got a, I got a suit on. You got a suit on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. Well, let's call the meeting to order. It's four o'clock. Anthony, can you do the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Council Member Weist? Aye. Widmer? Yes. Limpress? I'm here. Do we have Vice Mayor Lewis on? I don't think so. And I don't see her. I'll text her. Okay. Uh, Mayor DeGolio? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just make our little announcement about public comment. I, I don't see that we have very many visitors or guests on the phone, but we just want to make sure that folks joining the call um, recognize a few of the rules that we have in place. And I'm going to just put a little graphic up for all of us to take a look at. We're gonna ask everybody that's joining the call to be very mindful of making public comment. There's a few ways that you can do that. And so some of the ways that you can make public comment are by using the hand raise feature. You can also, that you're gonna find that at the bottom toolbar. If you click participants, you can access that. You can also contact me and you can do that either through my email, which I've posted in the chat. It's asuber at ci.atherton.ca.us or you can um, if you're dialing in, you can dial star nine. And to do star nine, that's going to make it so that you can use the hand raise feature. The graphic should be on your screen now. Um, we're also keeping a three minute limit to public comments. There's going to be some warning messages, two minute, one minute and 30 second warning, and then a time's up warning. And then so we're trying to be mindful of that. Nobody's going to get cut off. But if you do like to make a public comment, we just ask that you be respectful of that. And the mayor will always allow public comment during items and at the designated portions. Um, and if you want to participate and make a public comment, you'll need to uh, follow one of those rules. And with that said, um, I don't have anything at this point. Okay. Well, the first item on the agenda is to wish Anthony a happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. A birthday milestone. Yeah, big one. Birthday, Anthony. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I Here forgot you. to get the black roses for you. Is that what happens at 40? Actually, yeah. it's supposed to happen at 30, but I guess maybe people are living longer, so we do it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Are there any public comments? Uh, th these would be public comments for items that are on the agenda since today's meeting is a special meeting. 
and I have not received anything. Um, the only thing that we've gotten in advance was what was already distributed directly to the council. Um, and I have no hands raised, no texts, no emails. Okay. Well, let's move on to the first discussion item, which is the discussion and feedback regarding the fire services subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, at your last council meeting, there was conversation during the city manager's report uh, about the recent disbandment of the fire services subcommittee. Uh, there was uh, questions about the, the purpose of the fire services subcommittee and who represented the town with respect to fire service issues. Uh, and then there was a procedural challenge presented at the meeting as well. So the, the council uh, opted to put this on this agenda to have a deeper conversation around the issue. And that concludes the staff report. Okay, is there any public comment on this item? Or does anyone have any questions I should ask first? Councilmember Lewis is dialing in, she says. Right. I, I guess I do have a question, Rick. Sure. Yeah, and it's simply, I, I, I'm trying to, I went through the rules, by the way, thanks for sending those, uh, George and Mona, but the uh, question is, where does the mayor's authority um, come from that would enable him to disband a, a committee that's in existence, an ad hoc committee? Those are found in the council's policy under section eight, I believe. So uh, 8.3 8 ad hoc committees. I don't see that authority in there. I'm sorry, you don't see what specifically in there? Well, I see, the, as I read it, and, and I apologize for catching you, out, you know, off guard in the middle of the meeting, Mona. I, I, Hello, this is Elizabeth Lewis. Hi, Elizabeth, welcome. We're, Thank you, sorry I'm late. Um, I, um, yeah, anyway. Um, I'm only calling in by phone. Uh, can't can't do the video because I'm here at the hospital. Oh. Okay. Well, we just started to discuss item one. Okay, item one. Here we go. Okay. So I'm sorry, Mona. So we're, you're you're answering. You said it's section. If you look at at uh, section eight, you said that's where it's coming into play. Specifically, Section 8.3, which states for the benefit of the public who's also listening, ad hoc committees, the mayor may appoint ad hoc committees of less than a quorum of the city council as deemed appropriate and necessary. Such committees shall have a defined task and be of limited duration. Such committees are exempt from the provisions of the Brown Act, end quote. And that actually comports with the provisions of the Brown Act and generally how city councils um, are uh, governed because if council were to take action to form or disband subcommittees um, that are ad hoc committees, then that would constitute formal action of the council and that ad hoc committee would then be a standing committee subject to publication of notice, agenda, um, and a full Brown Act meeting. Gotcha. But as I read that, the mayor can appoint committees and the committee shall have a defined task and be of limited duration, right? And then in previous sections of the, uh, of, of our operating rules, the mayor's duties are limited unless they're expressly laid out, right? So I, where does that uh, permit the mayor to disband a committee? It would follow, I, I see your point that if it's not expressly stated, I think it's implied that the, the same person that um, creates the subcommittee may disband it. Um, however, I also yeah, I, think- I'm sorry, Mona, I got to push back on that. that. I don't think that, I, I would not, I, I'd like to explore that a little more. That doesn't make sense to me. Well, just to finish that. Yeah. Um, However, um, unlike the formation of an ad hoc committee, if the council were to disband an ad hoc committee, um, even though it would constitute formal action because it wouldn't trigger any sort of a, a, a Brown Act issue in the same way that the creation does, I see that that specific um, act can be done by either the mayor or by the council. Of course, the council could um, choose to interpret this differently or to revise this section so that it's clear on the intent. 
Mona, uh, I, also section 3.3 .3 of the handbook refers to subcommittees, basically says the same thing. Or maybe it's 3.4. 3 3.4, 3 yeah. 3.4. Yeah, it does say, but again, it doesn't address disbanding one. No. So if I can say uh, through the chair? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're, so in questions. we're in questions for clarification. Just to be clear. Okay. Um, okay. I I just want want to comment as uh, to when this was revised and what uh, and how the intents were, and so if we want to revise this, but I'll wait until you give me the uh, comment period. Okay, great. Are there any other questions for clarification? Okay, seeing none, is there any public comment? Anthony, do you, have, do you have any public comment? No, sir, I have no public comment. Again, for people who just joined the call, if you'd like to make a public comment, you can use the participants option at the bottom toolbar of your screen. You can text me, which is posted in the chat, repost it, or you can email me. Um, so please use those options. Right, okay. Um, uh, and let's bring it back to the council for comments, Elizabeth. Well, um, it's my recollection and um, uh, that when we recently um, revised this handbook, I think maybe it was 2010. Um, and it seemed to me that going through this, that when we decided that, you know, to codify the fact that we could um, have these ad hoc subcommittees that could meet um, kind of offline and um, on special projects uh, that needed uh, additional research or additional um, meeting time without having uh, to call a, a, an appropriate uh, uh, full public meeting, uh, that it would be uh, like task oriented, you know, uh, so say the, the RENA subcommittee could go and uh, meet on this during that time of the um, RENA allocation and negotiations uh, representing the town. And it would just be for that specific issue. Now, the I mean, it's like being on the housing committee. It's, it's not like a, 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 a committee that you're going to be on for uh, several years um, as the liaison. So, and the mayor was going to choose those people. Um, it, it wouldn't be put up to a vote of the uh, council. It'd be the mayor kind of choosing the people that uh, the mayor thought would be the best qualified uh, to represent like, you know, I don't know, whatever committee you're on. So, um, and so I think it's the mayor, it was assumed, I guess, that if the mayor put the ad hoc committee together, then the mayor would say when the project was over, he would disband it and it would just not be in perpetuity and not upon the decision of the members of the committee to decide one way or another. That's just how I've always interpreted it and um, it, that felt that that's how it went. So I, I can understand, uh, Mike, you're kind of um, wanting to make sure that we, this is all clarified and uh, maybe we need to uh, have a study session and revisit uh, and revise this handbook so that we clear up those ambiguities. Okay, any other comments? Yeah, I think it's something, I apologize to the mayor. 
you have a phone number? I, I have one. Okay, thank you. We have one uh, hand raised, uh, Mayor DeGolia from Bob Polito for public comment for you. Uh, well, we're in the council discussion period. We're really past public comments. Yes, sir. Uh, we can set uh, aside that for one public comment option at the end of the discussion, if you'd like. Yeah, let, let's let's take that after we've gone through at least the initial comments that the council members have. Yes, sir. Harry, were you? Yeah, I, I apologize. You know, I was going to reiterate. I think that this is probably an area that, uh, you know, because it, I, you know, lacks some form of clarity. That it's probably something as far as the handbook's concerned um, that we should look into um, on cleaning it up so that you know no state of confusion can occur in the future um, because obviously i hear mike's concerns as well and it uh, it is obviously something we could look at a little closer okay i'm having a little hard time hearing everybody but i'll turn my speaker up maybe Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a comment. I mean, if you can create something, you have to be able to disband it. Otherwise, and, and I could get into the substance of why I disbanded the committee. It just had nothing to do. And we had decided not to deal with this fire services issue during this pandemic period, which essentially means that it's off the table for this year. Um, and we're not going to come back to it. And we felt like it was not in the interest of the town to pursue it at this time. So uh, there's, there wasn't anything for the subcommittee to do. And the subcommittee hasn't done anything since uh, we were not able to pursue uh, the public discourse uh, process that we had decided to pursue as a council. So uh the, the reason i disbanded it was just because there was nothing to do uh and and there are other subcommittees frankly that i didn't disband but that i talked to george about disbanding that I, I hadn't even paid any attention to them because they had so little to do um that included includes the sea level rise subcommittee which i don't think is doing anything and, and a couple other similar subcommittees. So just for efficiency, uh, it, it seemed expedient to me. Um, they're not, they're not subcommittees, they're ad hoc committees. Excuse they me. are ad hoc yeah. subcommittees. They're called ad hoc subcommittees. Oh, oh. Okay. Of the just council. Clarifying. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think in our, in our procedures and our rules, we're going to cover every little item that requires a period and a cross T. Yep. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rick. I do think that if you're going to uh, be able to create something, then you can uncreate it. And the council certainly can change these rules. I, I don't have any problem with that if the council wants to do that. Yeah, I, I actually think under the current rules, there's a big distinction between creating something and uncreating it. And, and it comes at least in part, and I apologize, I'm looking at the handbook now and, and section 3.7 about the powers of the mayor, which says that other than administrative duties set forth in the municipal code, the mayor and the vice mayor shall have no additional powers or authority different from other members of the city council. And then it talks about the ability to effectively preside at meetings. And then if you go to section 8.3, which gives the mayor the authority to establish ad hoc committees, it limits that by saying that the mayor is that those are supposed to be of limited duration and uh, defined tasks. So I think when you when you have an, a committee that you set up for limited duration, that that does not imply that you have the authority to uh, terminate that meeting that that ad hoc subcommittee early. And I think then if you go back to the general rule, the mayor's got no powers. The council members don't have that. That once it's established, it's established till that limited duration ends. So if I could um, just comment count on. Um, yeah. Council Member Lempris's uh, comments there, and I think that in um, the 3.7 um, that you're referring to, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I that's kind of a much older document, and uh, and it, it's to say that 
it's a level playing field. I mean, there's no, there's, you don't, you're not a strong mayor. You're not going to get two votes when everybody else only gets one vote, you know, so we're all equal in, in that regard. And so, um, and, and I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I totally support it. I totally support it. And I think these uh, rules of procedure, and I'm looking at it now, uh, March uh, 2014, uh, I had my dates wrong, but uh, there had been an older one of these that was even more ambiguous. Um, and so I think when, uh, in the spring of 2014, we tried to uh, kind of manage it a little bit better. So anyway, um, I, I, I'm really having a hard time um, understanding why we're um, creating, I, I don't know why we're having this uh, um, discourse and disharmony in our uh, council at this time. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I, um, it, it makes me feel very uneasy and um, uh, out of sorts and I would hope that we could um, kind of come together and uh, look at um, some bigger picture stuff and not um, uh, be at odds about this. And if this is something that we need to relook at um, and uh, come together as council to de decide, you know, how we may modify some of these ambiguities in this rule of procedure document, uh, we should do that. But I, I'm really at a loss to understand um, why we're picking this apart like this uh, at this time. So I'd like to add something, if I could. Go ahead. All right, so uh, first off, I was happy with the way we ended the discussion last time where we said, hey, you know, if the fire district chooses to have some discussion with us, then in any manner that, that it would be back through, you know, carry, et cetera. Um, I do want to point out that in the, in the PAC document on page 58, which I pointed out to Mona as well, there is an appeal section in there and that's very broad. And uh, so um, if we need to look at our procedures, maybe we should do that. I think that we should bring them up to date and get them the way we think that they should be. Um, but, but uh, you know, I, I think that there, it, you know, the mayor, the mayor has no more power than any other council member. And I, I just think that that's, you know, we should, we should discuss, things periodically, but that's okay. I'm not unhappy with where we are. I think that it's, uh, it's good. I'm ready to move on and uh, that's it for me. All right, I'm looking forward to the next topic. It, it might help me then if somebody could summarize where we are, because I'm, I'm confused, I guess, about where we stand. What is the current state of play with regard to the council's interactions with the fire district? It's my understanding. So, it's, my, it's my understanding that, and some of this um, happened, of course, before my tenure as your city attorney. So, but it's my understanding that the mayor formed um, an ad hoc committee for purposes of communications with the fire district and those two ad hoc committee members also happen to be the city council liaisons to the fire district. Um, the mayor has um, disbanded the ad hoc committee for purposes of discussing potential withdrawal from the fire district. However, the council members um, status as the liaison to the fire district remains. So that is where we are um, absent some further direction from the council on how it wishes to interpret um, the council policies on disbandment of um, ad hoc committees. Uh, and just uh, to add to that uh, one last bit is the direction of the council with respect to our relationship with the fire district, those three or four bullet points 
that actually fed into the the role of that subcommittee hasn't changed. Right, those issues remain and the primary people who are the point people to deal with those are the liaison and the alternate liaison. Uh, my focus on the purpose of that subcommittee uh, included most importantly to negotiate with the fire district to try to come to some resolution to avoid uh, the process that we had initiated and that subcommittee and the fire board subcommittee did engage in negotiations they couldn't get anywhere I tried to get that negotiations going again and got zero response uh, when I contacted the president of the fire board. So uh, at that point, I felt that the subcommittee wasn't necessary. Uh, that's why I disbanded it. Uh, but for purposes of communication with the fire board mm -hmm. and, and on the fire services issues, liaisons are the representatives of the council. I think that addresses my concern on, on the issue of the fire district. Um, I, I still think we should update the rules, by the way, just to, or review them to make sure they say what we want them to say. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, thank you, Mayor, for the input on that. It just makes it clear as we move forward. Yep. Okay, uh, let, me, let me take public comment. Bob, you had a public comment. Would you like to make that now? Well, you, you answered my uh, question. Your, your point was, I, I think, that we couldn't reach out to the residents to, get a re to, to uh, discuss this topic with them, so to speak. And so there was no sense for the, nothing for the committee to do right now, so why not disband it? Correct. Um, I, I understand that. I hope, I, I realize there's some disagreement among the council members on this topic, um, but given the tens of millions of dollars that we're talking about uh, over the next decade, I hope that some effort will continue uh, in some way, shape or form. You're not gonna get cooperation from the fire district, it doesn't appear, but maybe the leg legislative option is still worth pursuing. Uh, I, I think if all the residents understood how much money we're talking about, I, I don't think they'd all agree that uh, we should just go along fat, dumb, and happy. That's all. Okay, thank you. Is there any other public comment? I have no others. Okay, well, well, why don't we move on? I think that this next topic is a very important topic and I'd like to give it a full hour and a half. Before you do that, uh, Mr. Mayor, just one question. I did hear two or three requests uh, from the council, but I don't know whether it was three or two to return the rules of procedure to the council at a future date for discussion. I, I think that everyone would agree with that. Okay. All right, moving on to the next item is item number four. For this one, it's a discussion of policing reforms and initiatives, and I'm going to turn it over to the police chief. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor, council members, members of the public, thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, this very important and timely subject. So Anthony with the PowerPoint. So first off, just let me say real briefly that the death of George Floyd on May 25th of this year while in police custody was tragic and disturbing for all of us, especially those of us uh, leaders in law enforcement. Uh, my sincere hope is I think it is with everybody that out of the tragedy that something positive occur and there have been calls for police reform, police disbanding and defunding. Um, the town of Atherton and the police department has a, has a long and a deep and a rich history of serving our residents uh, in a highly professional manner, <clears throat> meeting their needs, making them safe and secure. 
Um, in addition to that, you know, reform isn't new. In the September 19, Governor Newsom approved Senate Bill 230, which provides the most stringent deadly use of force law in the country, and it's something that our policies had already supported. And so what I wanted to address is a lot of the use of force and a lot of the questions that are coming comes down to training. And we're very fortunate here in the state of California, the California Post Peace Officer Standards and Training is very stringent in their requirements of training of topics like de-escalation, um, bias policing, use of force, intervention, crisis intervention training. And in the last fiscal year, our department provided 2,700 hours of training to our officers on those topics typically focusing high risk events, <clears throat> low frequency like use of force. Um, and I think all of us in, in law enforcement are taking a look at our training budget. Our budget for this next fiscal year is $70,000, which is a very robust budget. And it's some thanks to the council to support that, that we provide some high level quality training and more so than I, I would say than most agencies in this county. So we're very fortunate in that regard to reduce our risk and liability. Next slide, Anthony. So as we go through this and craft and, and tell what, I'm very fortunate as a police chief from the work that our officers do is I have very good information to pass on and a very good story to tell. When it comes to force, they talk about de-escalation and we always train using the, the least amount of force necessary and we have tools. There are less, we have our, first off we have our words, we have de-escalation, we have our hands and then the tools that we use commonly less lethal are our tasers, and we have a baton, we have OC spray, uh, we have a 40 millimeter launcher, which are all designed to stop the threat and to allow the officers to take someone into custody without uh, further assault or further use of force. Uh, next slide, our tools continue. So we're also fortunate to leverage technology. We were the first agency in this county to have body cameras, as which I wear one. We also were the first to have in-car video. Uh, our canine is an outstanding tool uh, to use to allow the dog to go into a very hazardous situation to avoid harm or injury to our officers. We use automated license plate reading technology to detect and deter crime. I talked about our baton, and we do do an extensive amount of training in de-escalation, crisis intervention, uh, and a lot of that is to get us to slow down our response when we can, keep it under control, and hopefully uh, avoid using force if we have to. Another great thing on our side in this town, we're very fortunate again, we always have three officers on duty, and when there is a calls for service, traffic stop, there's always at least another officer, if not a third, Sometimes that includes myself and the commander. Just having that presence allows us to gain control um, and hopefully maintain control of the situation and not have to use force with the show of force of two or three officers. Next slide, Anthony. So this slide is, is very important and I think it's where we have a really good story to tell here in Atherton. So in the last five year period, we had 55,000 calls for service, and we, we went through our data and made sure that we pulled out vacation house checks and others. What this represents is every time an officer may encounter a person, which may lead to force or it may lead to an arrest. So what that says is your officers are out there working hard every day. Uh, it includes 300 arrests, which could be from domestic violence uh, to DUI to assault with a deadly weapon. It runs the gamut. In those five years, uh, there were no uses of force by our officers. That's almost unheard of. Also during that time, we had six citizen complaints, none of which were founded or the officer was found to have acted within policy. Again, that's almost unheard of when you're dealing with that many calls for service. In 2020, most recently, we did have two uses of force, both of which were authorized. One was a wrist lock, which is a control hold to gain a suspect's uh, control to handcuff. The second, uh, we had officers responded with a mutual aid request to Oakland to deal with the George Floyd related protests. Um, the officers were on the line, they, were, they could not move. Uh, they were taking bricks and rocks, which could be lethal. Uh, our officer was able to fire two rounds of the 40 millimeter, which fires a basically a sponge round 
Uh, we did impact both the suspects and they ran away and stopped what they were doing, which is exactly what you want to do. Um, and the last officer involved shooting, thankfully, in Atherton was in 1979. And uh, speaking with the previous chief, nobody was injured or hurt, but there was a shooting involving a burglar that was fleeing by vehicle. Uh, and also related to that, I just, I just made a note. Uh, we just recently completed an in-depth study of our traffic stop data. Uh, in 2023, the state of California will require agencies our size to collect traffic stop data. Luckily, we're already doing a good job of that with our citations and warning sites because it does capture the race of the person that we've encountered. And out of all of our contacts, uh, you will find that the traffic stop data really relates to the demographics of this county. Uh, so we're very representative there. There was no evidence of any profiling whatsoever when looking at that data. And I think it's also important to note too that for an agency that of our size, we are very racially diverse. And I think we very well represent uh, the population that we protect, not only in our town, but in our county. Uh, next slide, Anthony. So as I mentioned when I started, uh, calls for police reform are not new um, and they will probably not stop. And I think they're gonna be coming more and more as society changes. Law enforcement has to become more nimble and respond to those changes. This is an example of President Obama five years ago in response to some calls for reform uh, conveyed a task force. And from that task force, they came up with these six pillars of law enforcement, all which I would be confident in saying law enforcement leaders have been embracing for years and now we use this as a guideline on the foundation of the policing that we have. We do a lot of work in our outreach to build the trust and legitimacy of the residents. We don't have their trust, we can't exist. Uh, we have very stringent policies and oversight. We use a company called Lexapol for our policy development. They become a national standard for law enforcement. Um, for each state, they have an expert group of policy development folks, uh, lawyers, tracking state law and national law, making sure that our policies are continual up to date. So we're fortunate to have that uh, policy procedure for us. Technology, social media, as I mentioned, uh, again, thanks to council and supporting the police department. We leverage technology through our body cams, through our tasers, um, everything that we can for officer safety, for community engagement. And we leverage social media quite a bit, again, to get the information out uh, for community policing and then for crime reduction. Training and education I spoke about. Officer safety and wellness, which is the sixth pillar, is an extremely important one in the type of, that, of, of the type of work that we do daily. Next slide, Anthony. So in direct response to uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, President Trump came out with an executive order in June 2020. Uh, one of the main points was a call for assuring that agencies were accredited. And what accredited means is that an independent body is looking at policies, procedures, audits, inspections to make sure that not only is the agency telling us what they're going to do, but they show and prove that we are doing it. Uh, we recently complete, completed a, a long-term accreditation process here within the police department. We utilize standards from the police and sheriff's group in, in Washington state and they would apply to any state. Unfortunately, California does not have the same process. Uh, what we will be seeking in response to Trump's request is to become accredited by CALEA, and it's the Commission <clears throat> on Law Enforcement Accreditation, and it's a very intense process. It does involve some funds, and I'll be working with George on that. My goal is to see if we can become accredited by CALEA during this fiscal year. Next slide, Anthony. Also in response, uh, our Attorney General came out with a call for reform and he identified eight procedural rules. There's also, also been a movement that I'm sure most of you are aware is that eight can't wait. And they're very similar as you see in this comparison and I'll go through each of them and tell you how we respond to those. Next slide, Anthony. So intervention, what, what's, what I'm glad to be able to report that in all these calls for reform or rules, they're already covered by our lexical policies. In our use of force, it dictates very clearly that there's a duty for officers to intervene when they see officers doing like what you saw back in Minneapolis to intervene and stop uh, unauthorized use of force or any other behavior. 
We have removed uh, the chokehold carotid restraint policy from our procedure. We no longer support that as post does not. Uh, as I mentioned in our use of force policy and throughout the other policies, we do talk about very specifically about de-escalation. We have training that addresses that specifically annually. Proportionality, and that kind of deals with a, cont a continuum use of force. That's also in our use of force policy and in our training. We're always trained to use the least possible force necessary in order to gain control of the suspect to protect the officer and to protect citizens that already exists verbal warnings that's a very that's a very good one to call out it's in our use of force policy every time we go to the range and we go to the range four to six times a year we review our use of force policy it's in our training as we're shooting we're to use verbal warnings to stop police but again it's important to know that sometimes that may not be possible and it may, the situation may accelerate so fast, the officer does not have a chance to identify. But when and where they can, they must use a verbal warning. Shooting from or shooting at moving vehicles, that's also covered specifically in our use of force policy. You can't say shall not, because there may be a situation where an officer must shoot at a moving vehicle to stop a suspect from harming others. Um, also, to shooting from a moving vehicle, there may be a situation where that's their only way to protect themselves is shooting from a moving vehicle. But it is important to note, it's in our policy that it is, they're not to go in that direction with moving vehicles unless they have to. Deadly force at a last resort, that's always what we want. We never want to have to use force or take another person's life. And it's very easy to say that an officer must do everything possible before uh, they use deadly force. That's not possible. The situations that we get ourselves involved in can go from zero to 60 in seconds, and the officer has seconds to make a decision that's going to be reviewed and analyzed for months or even years. They have to rely on their training, and every situation is different. Call for comprehensive reporting. We already do have comprehensive reporting. If there was a use of force, it's important to know that the district attorney's office is the investigating <clears throat> authority and has a team expert team to come in and to assist our agency. Absent that, whenever we have a use of force, we have a pursuit, any, any other type instance, we have a review that's conducted by the sergeant, reviewed by the commander with recommendations to me. And if it were a very serious use of force or very serious incident for objectivity and transparency, I would call for the sheriff's office or the highway patrol to come in and do that investigation for me. They also called, or the Attorney General also called for canine use, and this one was a new, new one to myself. Uh, as you know, and the public may not know, we do have two canine units within the police department, and we have for many, many years. Uh, the AG is, is recommending, or strongly recommending, that it, the dog not seek and bite, but that it surround and bark. I'm not sure how to respond to that. We're working with our canine training vendors now. I, in my opinion, I don't think that's going to be possible. But again, it's important to know from the extensive training that our canine officers have and our policies, they're required to announce when they can. We're going to be releasing the dog. This is your last chance to come out. And the canine is a very important officer safety tool because if we think that there is a suspect in a home that's dangerous. Joe, it's okay we can send in the dog uh, first as a first response uh, to, to apprehend the suspect so officers can come in and protect their own safety. Next slide, Anthony. So as you can see, the eight can't wait. I won't go back through each one, um, but it's essentially the same requirements or the same ask of the Attorney General. And I think it's also important to note, except for chokeholds and strongholds, which we're now no longer supporting, it isn't like we just updated our policies since May 25th. These have been in place for some time and been standard procedures for quite a while uh, in the law enforcement profession. Next slide, Anthony. So as I said when I started, you know, the, the best hope that I can have from the tragedy that occurred with George Floyd is to look for the positives and always look for improvement because there is always room for improvement. Um, we need to work on our community relationships. And I think we do very well at that through our town meetings, through our ADAPT group and others. But I think what's important to know is we receive a lot of training, de-escalation, bias police policing, to get us to understand and appreciate to walk in a, 
another person's shoes. I don't think we're doing the best job uh, of getting people to understand and train about what the police do and what we don't do, why we do it and why we don't. We do a very good job addressing that with our Citizens Academy and we'll be hopefully able to host one again this fall, which that will be some of the main topics. And <clears throat> each and every one of our policies needs to be consistent with the mission of the department, which it is. <clears throat> We continually have training <clears throat> on our policies and reinforce. <clears throat> Luckily for us with Lexapo, excuse me. Lexapo is a living document where we commonly get updates and training bulletins where the officers are asked to review policies each month, take a self test and all that is documented. So it isn't a book that sits on the shelf. It's live and we're constantly uh, utilizing the, the policies with our officers. Next slide, Anthony. So the next steps, as I mentioned, we will be pursuing <clears throat> CALEA accreditation, which I think is a great move forward. I think that we were ahead of the curve by doing it internally. Uh, and I'm very confident with the policies and procedures and how our, our department operates. But having an outside entity looking in and saying the same thing to me speaks volumes. We're going to continue to focus on our training and even look more so this year of where we can enhance it and focus it where we need. We're gonna keep working on expanding public engagement and transparency. We're adding information to our, our website that addresses these specific concerns. Uh, I have recommended and I, I've had good success and luck with them prior is resident surveys. So they can tell us how they think that we're doing. They can also tell us where they think we should focus. That kind of feedback is invaluable uh, to me. Uh, we will continue our Citizens Academy and we'll continue doing, you know, as, as I know when I first was hired as Chief Counsel, your marching orders to me, one of the main ones, and I, and I listened intently, was increasing community outreach because most people in this community are behind a wall or a gate and it's hard to get them engaged. I do believe Zoom is gonna be a tool that's really gonna help us do that and we'll be concentrating on that as we have in the past and as we have uh, going forward. So in, in just closing, you know, I, I know that we need to get people to understand more about what we do and that's hard. And we talked about officer wellness, which is important because this job is extremely, extremely serious. It's very rewarding, but it also has impacts. If you haven't been shot at, if you haven't had somebody try to stab you or assault you, or at the same time, you're giving mouth to mouth and CPR to a DUI suspect in the middle of the freeway who just killed a family of four, which all those things have happened in my career, you can't understand. Um, and I think we need to do a better job to get the public to understand what and why we do. And in closing, the mayor made a very good observation when we were developing this presentation about the culture and how much it affects an agency. Cultural issues like what you saw in Minneapolis are systemic. Again, I'm very fortunate the culture of this police department will not tolerate unauthorized use of force. It will not tolerate misbehavior and mistreatment of our residents. And again, I am very proud <clears throat> of this police department. And it's not in the last three years. This has been going on for years. Our culture continues to get better. The people we're hiring are outstanding. Uh, we represent the community. And I think we do a very good job. And with that, I'm going to stop. And the part that I enjoy the most <clears throat> is the question and answer and, and see what issues I can address. I can't hear him, Anthony. Not on mute. Council can all <clears throat> Sorry, I, I was muted. Uh, I was asking if anyone on the council has questions of clarification. Through the mayor. Please. Uh, Chief, can you just uh, expand a little bit on um, who requires and what are the requirement standards in the police academy related to use of force? So who's the guiding light for California's training of police officers? Well, the guiding light is post. And I will tell you, um, having been a law enforcement officer for years in Washington, California the policing profession here in California with POST has served as an example 
and on the cutting edge of law enforcement for other departments across the country. So POST does a very good job and myself coming into the state from out is a good example. And you're all, I think, painfully aware of the amount of training and the amount of work that I had to do to become a certified law enforcement executive, even though I was in Washington state, they take it very seriously. They're constantly looking at their policies and procedures and practices in all academies in California, and there are a lot of them, there's only two in the state of Washington, they all prescribe to post and all must meet their standards. Thank you. Did, do you want to follow up with the, on that, Carrie? Uh, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm good for right now. Thank you. Okay. So I've got a question for the chief, if that's okay. Please. So, so Chief, I, I, first off, I, uh, you know, I, I uh, really appreciate everything you and Chief Flint before you did, and and what all the officers, you know, and the and the manner in which they manage themselves. I think we all are very happy with with the way things are going, and 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 your leadership. Uh, a, a couple of questions. You you had some statistics of of uh, the number of. Uh, not only the traffic stops, but also uh, the different types of calls for services. It would be good, um, you know, and I'm sure it would take some time, but uh, you think it would be possible to get it like a Pareto of what those types of calls for services were so that we and the public could better understand what they are, you know, in, in broad categories. And secondly, um, you know, Every once in a while, generally once a year, uh, there there is emails that come across that people make uh, accusations of of uh, racial profiling of of traffic stops. And uh, I realize when you're shooting the, the the radar gun at somebody, you don't know who's in the car. You can't see them for the most part. Um, but you do see who those people are when you go up to talk to them and look at their identification. So, um, you know, George shared with me your, your documentation that showed, um, you know, the stops by, by uh, demographics and compared those to the county's demographics, which was great, um, which we should share with the public and make public. Um, but then also, the, 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 once they are stopped, then you actually see the people that are in the car. And so it'd be great if, if you could possibly put together a, a report that shows the, you know, the profiling of, of or the ratio of the number of who's got stopped and who got a warning versus who got a ticket. And I realize there are mitigating circumstances with regards to that. Um, but I think that that would be something that would be helpful. I don't know if, if, if you believe that that would be something that you could do uh, uh, periodically, like once a quarter or something like that for George to post. But uh, if you could comment on that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so in response to your first question, it's very easy for us to pull what we call RIMS, which is our computer-aided dispatch system, to pull out all the types of calls that we go to. I send George uh, twice a day, our, our day log and our night log, which lists all of those, and we can pull out, you know, all the types of responses that we do go to. Uh, in response to your second question, I, I believe if you look at that traffic stop data report that we developed, it does uh, address the question that you ask, and if you do look at it closely, which I did, you will see that <clears throat> Hispanic drivers in some categories are receiving more tickets than non-Hispanic. And, and basically what that relates to is the fact that this isn't a racial comment at all, but it's very common for the Hispanics in, in this area not to have a driver's license, not to have identification, or not to have a valid driver's license. And when you dive down into it, that's where you see that discrepancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and other than that, I believe that report is pretty detailed and it kind of addresses that. And it didn't take that much work to do that were the five and a half years of data. And so that will be available. And as I mentioned, starting in 2023 and our computer aided dispatch vendor is working now for an agency our size, we have to collect that data, not just on the traffic tickets, 
but on any contact that we have, which will further enable us to make sure that we are not racially profiling. All right. And then, then the second question to you, um, President Trump's as well as the, the AG had recommendations in there for creation of a database to track police officers with multiple instances of, of excuse me, misconduct. And I understand right now that the legislators uh, has to make some changes uh, potentially. Um, how do you feel about that? I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. On that. Well, I think it's great. I think it, it should, you should have that level of transparency. You know, officers shouldn't be able to hide. And I think one of the things, again, the positives that are going to come out of this, this tragedy is the fact that we do do a better job of tracking those officers. There's some people in this profession, quite frankly, that should just not be in this profession. And as you all know, with unions and associations, it does make it difficult to remove those folks uh, dealing through the appeal process. But I do think it's important. And it gets back to what I said before, the great story that we have to tell in all those contexts with all those violators and suspects and every call that we've done for the last five and a half years to have really no citizen complaints and none that are founded. And believe me, when they make a complaint, we it's addressed, we look into it, it's investigated, the commander reviews it, I make a recommendation. There's no hiding any of it. But what it tells me is our officers every day as I talked about our culture, they know what my expectations are, but I don't even need to tell them because they know what the right thing is to do. And that's what they're doing every single day. Okay. Well, thanks. Rick, if I could, a couple of questions. Please, Phil, Mike, um, and, and Chief, some of these are just quick, I hope, but could, uh, the, you used the term use of force. Can I just understand what that means exactly? What is a use of force? So use of force is any time that we basically have to go hands-on with the suspect. It can be just merely a voluntary the suspect's compliant. We handcuff them. That's not a use of force. But if they're trying to resist or they're trying to assault and we use any of our tools, meaning a control hold, a takedown to the ground, um, that runs the gamut all the way from basic hand-to-hand -to, -hand to lethal force. Anytime. So just so I understand, you're saying that for the last five years, over 55,000 calls, excluding 2020, over 55,000 calls, there was no hand-to-hand -hand force? There were no uses officer of force. And, and a suspect? No. no, other than the two recent. Wow. Okay. Um, also, I'm a little confused about terminology. I want to make sure I get this clear. Um, sometimes I see carotid restraint. Sometimes I see chokehold. Sometimes I see stranglehold. Have we banned all uses of putting a, an officer's arm or hands or anything around the neck of a suspect to try to do anything? We have. So the official term is carotid restraint. What it's designed to do <clears throat> is put pressure on the carotid artery and it actually makes the person go unconscious. When applied correctly, uh, it's very effective, but often, you know, due to lack of training or anything else, it can be applied incorrectly, resulting in death when death wasn't warranted for what was happening. That said, I think it's important to note too is we have tools, we have policies, we have everything else, and it may be hard maybe for the public to understand this, but if you're fighting for your life and you don't have any other tools available except that tool, uh, you're gonna have to do what you need to do to save your own life. That said, it's not allowed by normal practice. Okay. Um, I think I understand that. Then with regard to um, hiring, I, I don't, what are we doing today to make sure that we're not hiring people that have records of misconduct, which seems to come up quite a bit? Well, that is, we have a background investigator. She actually used to be a sergeant with this agency, and she's married to a commander in the sheriff's office. She's very, uh, very experienced. Our background investigations are exhaustive. They can take three to four months to go from interviews in the home, interviews with neighbors, interview with other agencies where they may have worked, psychological exam, medical exam, a polygraph exam, meeting with family members, coworkers, everything that we can, no stone unturned, to get that right candidate that we want. Okay, and by the way, when I said it comes up quite a bit, I didn't mean to say in Atherton, but just nationally, that seems to be an, an issue. Um, the the couple other questions, um, and I apologize for this, but I want to make sure I understand what I'm, I'm talking about here. The, um, uh, when you, you talked about the, the the 
workforce we have in the Atherton Police Department, you said it looks a lot like the county, I forget what words you use, but it looks a lot like the county. Statistically, how are we in terms of, of the ethnic and cultural background of, of our police department? We just put together a pie chart. Unfortunately, I don't have that uh, on my desk. Uh, I can tell you we have two female officers. We have several Hispanic officers, uh, Asian, Black, White. Uh, I think for our size, we're very racially diverse. And again, but it's important to note too, we don't go out and hire and think, well, we need to have, we need to be represented in this portion of the population. We interview and hire the best candidates, but I think what's great in doing that is we are very racially balanced and do represent the county population well. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you also just tell me, uh, how do we enforce the, what is the current policy with regard to body cams and when they must be on and how do we enforce that? What happens if somebody doesn't That's comply? That's a good question. So when I first arrived, and I think Mayor DeGoli is aware of it, I forget the gentleman's name, I think it was Winnett, where he was detained because he thought he was trespassing at a house near a golf course. All of our officers had body cams at the time and he made a complaint and unfortunately, it was very unfortunate, none of the body cams were operated. Um, that complaint was investigated, it was found that he was being legally detained. Uh, there wasn't really any officer action that could be taken because at the time there was permissive language saying the body cam should. So when I arrived three years ago and started my administrative review, that's something we changed right away so that it shall and now we have instituted, and I think we're on our second or third body cam <clears throat> audit that we do twice a year. And we do a percentage of traffic stops and they look at, it's not designed to catch an officer doing something in behavior, but if you do and you notice it, you have to investigate it, but it's designed to take a look. And our last audit, I think our first audit numbers were poor. They were about 68%. Now we're up closely uh, hovering around 90%. And during that audit time, um, when we found violations, they were counseled and issued reprimands. That could lead to termination if people aren't turning on their body cam? Well, it could. I mean, if I continually have an officer saying, I don't care what you say, I'm not gonna use the camera, well then that's insubordination and I would fire them. Okay. Um, two other questions, this one's a little bit broader. I'm, I'm focusing on mutual aid requests right now. And it seems interesting to me that two of the uses of force were it sounded like mutual aid requests recently in, in Oakland. Is that right? Or that's correct. If I got that right. Okay. I, um, this is a question, but my, my assumption is that there's a, a very different risk profile to going into a uh, riot or similar situation, civil unrest in a larger city than there is typically in Atherton. And I want to know what, what controls we have to protect our officers and ourselves to make sure that we don't get ourselves in trouble by trying to help out somewhere else? That's a good question. And we do have protocols for mutual aid <clears throat> within the county uh, and throughout the state. They're very common in every state. Um, it would put me in a difficult situation if another agency is asking for mutual aid and I don't provide it because I think I'm gonna put an officer in risk we live and, buy, live and die by our mutual aid and our support. Um, and it's something that we address. We don't send our officers in blindly. We know in this county that they're going to go with a supervisor from another agency and they're in a group together. And then they have to rely on their training and their policies and procedures. But like I said, it, it would be not impossible, but it, it would put me in an awkward situation to say, well, we're not gonna be participating because guess what? When I have to ask for mutual aid, it's not going to happen. And you don't want to get in that situation. I understand. But are you, are you exercising your judgment before agreeing to a mutual aid request to make sure that we're not putting an officer in an untenable or difficult situation where he or she's not properly trained, for example, or he or she's facing a situation? And by the way, one example would be recently in Atlanta, several of the suburban agencies actually did not provide officers because they were concerned at uh, there had been an officer there who was uh, some viewed as improperly uh, prosecuted by a district attorney and it lost the confidence of, of police agencies and some refused to go in. Have you, do you have any, ex any discretion to exercise in that kind of a situation? Oh, you do. And certainly, you know, Oakland is another example as we talk with the commander, he talks to the commanders up there, what's the situation, what are their assignments going to be? And typically, as you can imagine in Oakland, like what you see in Seattle, um, it's up to typically 
the police force within the city to do most of the work in their town. When mutual aid comes, they're coming up to protect the perimeter, called in if they're needed. But we do certainly look at those situations. What are we sending them into? Who are they going to be reporting to? What equipment will they be using? Chief, okay. Chief would you uh, explain the difference as well between a typical mutual aid response to an adjacent agency and a request to send support to Oakland, Berkeley, or somewhere like that? Well, they're both requests for mutual aid. Um, it's not typical for us to go out to another county, but we're prepared to. Normal mutual aid would be, they have a large accident situation in Redwood City or Menlo Park. They need us to come for traffic control or there's some other large incident going on where they need numbers of officers right away. It's very situational dependent. My last question, I, I promised on this question session, is, is simply, um, do you think that if you are able to identify someone who I will call a bad cop, that we have the ability to get rid of that person? Or what changes would you like to see to that process? We do have the ability, and I know this is a tough subject, especially when you're dealing with unions and everything else and associations. Unions are in place for a very good reason. I think employers did abuse employees and these protections were put into place. Um, I will say, and from my experience, when you do have a bad actor that needs to be removed, it's very frustrating for a law enforcement leader when you have all the information and they should be terminated. Administrative law judges and others reverse the decision, it's too much discipline and then they come back. Uh, I personally would like to see some sort of reform that makes it easier to remove someone that not, should not be a police officer. And I think any police officer, if you asked them, they would concur with that. Nothing specific though? Nothing specific as for now, we have very stringent procedures, internal affairs measures, um, documentation, progressive discipline. I have all the tools necessary uh, and, and use them when we need to. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Chief. If I could just add to that, from a legal perspective, um, police officers are protected by the Police Officer Bill of Rights, which provides a very structured um, <clears throat> step in which uh, potential policy or legal violations are assessed. There's an internal investigation that's done, and there's a number of appeals processes. So once um, the department issues a determination and there's a Skelly hearing, the potential opportunity for um, an appeal to arbitration and so forth. So um, as the chief was mentioning, um, it's not something that can happen instantaneously. Um, and sometimes these do take quite a while, but we have to operate within the legal requirements of state law. That's a good point, but the one tool, the one tool I do have is to immediately administratively assign somebody to their home so they're no longer on the force. You take their badge, you take their ID, you take their gun. So that is a tool that I have to immediately mitigate whatever threat or risk or liability to the town that there could be. Thank you. Uh, Chief, I have a couple questions. Uh, one was really a follow-up to a question that Council Member Lempris was asking. You said uh, that the department now had been at so, something like a 70% compliance. I don't remember the number you gave, and now we're closer to 90%? On the body cameras, yes. Uh, okay. Can, um, what, what, what does that mean, 90% of what? So there would be a 90% of the percentage of traffic stops that we utilize. And so we're basically doing... If I remember correctly, I think it's 25 or 50 incidents per officer per audit. And most, when we analyze, like, how come we're not at 100%? What is that 10%? Sometimes it's officer error, unintentional failure to activate, and sometimes it's equipment failure. Okay. So, and the percentage is the percentage of times that the body cam is on when the officer is interviewing the driver that he or she has pulled over. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, great. Um, and in that context where, because I, I think for Atherton, given that we're community policing, 
the management of traffic and congestion is a really big part of the job. Um, I mean, I understand that there can be other situations that come up uh, that present greater danger, potentially greater danger, but the most common interaction that I see has to do with traffic stops. Uh, in general, are we ever pulling people over without a specific incident, like observing, you know, a problem with the equipment or some kind of traffic behavior that uh, that necessitates an interaction? Are, are, are we ever just pulling people over um, for no reason? Well, no, that would be illegal. Um, we have to have probable cause to make a traffic stop. And you're right, <clears throat> you know, traffic, as you all know, is our number one issue in town. And so we do actively work targeted enforcement, traffic law enforcement. But no, we every stop has to have a probable cause for it. Um, and also, too, just an example, a lot of people think, well, they're just making a traffic stop. Traffic stops one of the most dangerous things that we do because we don't know who's driving that car. We know that they just did something wrong uh, technically, but we don't know what's going on in that car. Um, each and every time you walk up to that car, you never know. Um, but we we never stop. I can't you know I can't say anybody that never stops somebody in law enforcement driving a car for doing nothing. But uh, I'm very confident that our, our officers are not doing that at all. So just to follow up then, I, I, based on what you said, is it accurate to say that our officers are never pulling someone over just because of who is in the car? There has to be some behavior that they've observed that constitutes probable cause. Would that be accurate? Or there has, maybe the there license? Has, yeah, there has to be, uh, or again, it would be illegal. Or if that were occurring, uh, I would expect you would hear through citizen complaint or other that this officer pulled me over for no reason. We look into it. We find that there wasn't. Again, you know, that's that would be grounds for termination. Okay, great. Through the mayor. Does anyone else have a, further questions? Yeah, through the mayor, if I could. Okay, please, Carrie. Uh, Chief, you know, I'm sorry. Maybe you, know, you can a little expand on the process of hiring. You mentioned background is there other things that are required when you hire a police officer i know obviously the application but can you explain that process so that i you know, get a kind of an understanding of how detailed of a process it is hiring somebody is it so, similar you know, to the yeah just the very basic so you you have to be at least 21 years of age a citizen of the u.s of course a graduate of high school there is no college graduation requirement although some agencies are doing that so when they apply to us, they, they submit a personal history statement. We conduct, the commander and I, uh, this not, does not happen in all agencies, but the commander and I personally interview these folks right up front. Uh, it's very important uh, in, a, in any agency, but especially Atherton, that it be the right fit for us. And it doesn't stop there. We then require them to ride with an office, two different officers, and we're getting peer feedback because quite often the candidates will relax with an officer in the car. And then we get the thumbs up from the officers. We like what we see, we like what we hear. We move forward with the background. So with the background, as I said, that can take three to four months. Um, it involves a lot of legwork, talking to previous employers, talking to references, talking to family members, doing a home visit. That may sound funny, but it's very important to see how does this candidate live? Uh, is it look like it's the standards that meet with Atherton and a police and a police officer? We conduct a detailed and extensive psychological uh, exam, medical exam, polygraph exam, and the polygraph deals with every aspect walk of life that they have. And one of the questions that the commander and I always ask when they're sitting in my office before they go to polygraph is, "You need to tell us now what is the worst possible thing we're going to find out about you." Because if it changes once you take the polygraph, you're no longer going to be a candidate. Uh, they delve into their finances, their credit history. We're looking at every possible thing that deals with character or character flaws so we can make a solid decision that we're going to hire. And then it's important to remember once we do hire, that person is on probation for 18 months. So we get a chance essentially to test drive them for 18 months 
And if it doesn't look like it's working out or there's disciplinary issues, I do have the ability to remove somebody uh, while they're on probation. And then once after that 18 months of field training, everything else goes, uh, you have a very good sense that this is going to be a very good fit for this agency and the town. What about a lateral, Chief? So in a lateral officer hire, it would be the very same process, just because they came from another agency or like I did from out of state. There's still a full background investigation done. We look at all the reports, and every police chief is very cooperative. We look at all their internal affairs reports. We look at their disciplinary record. We look at their history, again, to see uh, if this lateral is a good fit for us. And when an officer is leaving another agency, the first question I have is, why are they leaving? Are they leaving for good reasons or are they running from something which sometimes is the case? And, and Chief, does a lateral have the same probation? Yes, when they come to us, they go back on 18 months probation. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, Okay, I don't see any further questions. Let's take public comment. You have Greg Conlon and Mr. Conlon, you have the floor. Greg, are you there? Yes, I, uh, <clears throat> fortunately or unfortunately, I spent too much time on these issues in the last five days. Uh, I've read both the House bill and the Senate bill, and I've reviewed a lot of television and so I'm knee deep in the issues, but I, I don't think they relate to Atherton, so I'm not gonna take the time to, I think the only thing I've, uh, I guess a couple points on it is the federal laws could change that would be a disadvantage to the police officers. And the reaction of them to that change, particularly qualified immunity, would be uh, something that I think any police officer would wanna rethink when he's taken a lot of risk. So I, I, I think in New York, that's happened in New York City of New York, the crime in certain parts of town, they just ignore it because they don't wanna go in and, and run the risk of uh, being challenged of, of doing things that are inconsistent. Uh, and I'm not sure that qualified immunity is the reason they feel that way, but there are some changes in that law in New York that takes away a lot of the rights that they had before. So I think that's the, the one thing I wanted to make on the, uh, it could impact us that the police officers may not want to be as risk taking if they make a lot of changes at the federal level that would impact them. But the other issue I want to talk that's not related to what's happening at the uh, George Floyd at all is the risk of the school uh, disasters that we've had over the last five years. And I've talked to the chief about it and I've talked to other people about it, but you know, we're during the day, we have 9,000 students in Atherton and we only have 7,000 residents or thereabouts. So we have a great uh, student population that we've got a police force with one resource officer for 9,000 kids. And it just, uh, it makes a, a real challenge to be prepared for the, any type of, not terrorist, but some crazy coming into one of the schools and, uh, and causing a uh, disaster. So I just don't know, Chief, whether there's anything that you thought about that would be good or bad or indifferent as a result of the George Floyd thing, the, as far as uh, worrying about the terrorist thing. Well, one thing I would like to comment on, and thank you, Greg, for bringing up the SRO. Um, I know many of you are aware of, <clears throat> in Seattle, the superintendent of public instruction uh, severed all ties with the Seattle Police Department and no presence in their schools. That's really disturbing and troubling. That's what the whole SRO program is about. It's about developing the relationship with our youth who are going to be tomorrow's adults with the police department intervening and doing anything we can to keep that kid out of the criminal justice system and on the right path. Uh, so when I got, when I received that, when I saw that article, I immediately called <clears throat> all of our superintendents, the dean of the college, and I got overwhelming support uh, for the school resource program. What's troubling is what I heard about today is the superintendent of public instruction for California 
apparently made similar comments about school districts severing ties with the police department and the school resource officer. I can tell you right now, that would be a tragic mistake. Um, we have had a school resource officer in this department for years. We get tremendous feedback from them. I could actually honestly use a second one for the impact. Uh, the one that we have now essentially is full time at MA High School where you have 2,700, 2,700 kids and the calls for service that we get there range from sexual assault to gun on campus to you name it. It's happening in that small city of teenagers uh, every day during the school day. Okay. Um, I think Norma Fogelsung has a public comment. Uh, I'd like to thank the chief and uh, our council people for bringing this topic forward. And I'd also like to express the support of our ADAPT board and our area coordinators in our partnership with the Atherton Police Department and also the support of council and the mayor and the vice mayor. When I look at that first slide again, President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force, I, and I look at the first bullet, building trust and legitimacy, I think our partnership with both the chief and the department has been exceptional in building ADAPT, and ADAPT is all about engaging our residents. And I know that when the chief shows up on a Zoom call, we get the engagement. When the chief walks into a meeting and people know he's gonna be there, people come. And um, I wanna thank the chief for this. And also for the training and education that you provided with the, um, uh, the various, oh, what was it? The chief, what was the, the academy? Citizens Academy. Thank you, the Citizens Academy. Uh, that was exceptional in terms of learning what our police department um, does and how they operate. And I think really critical for our citizens, if they can be a part of it, to attend. So I just wanted to express our thanks and continued partnership. And we appreciate your guidance and direction. That's it. Great. Thank you, Norma. Is there any other public comment? I don't see any. Anthony, do you have any other public comment? No others. Okay. Uh, then let's bring it back to the council for discussion. Anybody on the council have a comment? If I could, through the mayor. Please, Carrie. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, all my colleagues will agree that chief, I think that you and uh, your predecessors, as well as the members of your leadership team and the Atherton Police Department do a fat, an excellent job in providing uh, a high level of service. And I'm very pleased to hear um, some of your comments related to and followed up with the statistical information on all the issues that raise your concerns in the screening process to, to hire applicants that meet the criteria of the town's needs and, and obviously the liability component. Um, I am disappointed to hear what I heard nationally as well because I do know that the success of the um, SRO program way back from the days of the DARE program um, and the impacts to the kids in the high schools and so on, that relationship building um, has probably curtailed quite a number of um, kids from going the wrong way. So I'm disappointed to think that we would cut that program or think that that would happen. Um, but I, you know, want to reiterate that I think, you know, everybody here is doing a fabulous job. It doesn't mean that the story ends here because we can always do better. Um, and I understand that, uh, the uh, local academies are all re-looking at what they have in the post standards of training are going to increase. And, you know, we obviously apply a layer of the onion, even on top of what the state's requirements with post requirements are. 
um, because of our sensitivity to those or any concerns. So, you know, thank you and your entire team and the people that have retired in this department because I think we've, you guys have done an excellent job. Thank you. Is there any other uh, comment? Mike or Bill, do you wish to comment? Bill, we can't hear you, Councilmember. Oh, I. Okay, here I am. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so, Chief, thanks a lot to you and your and your officers, uh, as well as uh, the men and women and the dispatch. That, you know, they develop a great relationship with many, many people in the in the community. I uh, appreciate the. Uh, uh, the record keeping, if we could maybe see that record keeping quarterly or something like that, I think that that would be good, not only for the council, but also uh, to have that up on the website for our people, uh, our residents. Um, I do believe, uh, and I'm fully supportive of uh, the database. Um, I think that that would make your hiring process a little bit easier um, and I do think it's something that we that we do need uh, as a nation as well as you know as an organization so um, I, you know I would hope that uh, chief you and the city manager George and 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 the mayor could potentially you know draft the letter for for the council to review and then send off to our lo local uh legislative uh representatives and ask them if they would be uh you know supportive of of making this database that uh, the state attorney general as well as the president has suggested um and i think that uh yes we have we have great rules with regards to the union and and a lot of them are very very uh productive and necessary uh, but I do think that they're, they, in some cases, they might be a little bit overbearing. And I think that those two need to be somewhat adjusted so that you have a, a few more activities that, or, or possibilities for, for dealing with something should it actually occur. But uh, I do appreciate that. I also support, uh, Chief, your, your comments with regards to uh, bite and hold as opposed to circle and bark. Um, I uh, I just don't see how that's going to be very very effective. So I you know I'm 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 with you on that too. So um, we can include that in a letter too if you'd like. But those those are my comments. Thanks. Okay, Rick, if I could. Yes, please. Mike. Yeah, just um, sort of a broader thought is obviously there, there's a lot going on nationally um, where people are raising you know deep deep issues about police community relationships um, and they're tumultuous a little bit and erratic um, but I just our, our role is local and as we focus on our local police um, I'd start just by saying that that, that you, I'm proud to be associated with this with the police department and the work they're doing in the, in the town of Atherton um, the police are, are very important to the town there's they're, they're central in many ways to uh, our our life as a, as a town and then our, our feeling of, of safety and trust and community. Um, it's just very, very important. And that's not to say that our police department is perfect. Obviously it's not, but I think what, what is to say is that, that they, that they're trying and they've been trying. And with regard to um, some of the statistics we just heard, you can see some of the result, results are actually pretty astonishing. Um, in terms of, of community, the, the trust of the community, one of the things that the chief did not mention, which I find really extraordinary and, and perhaps unique, I don't know, in, in the country, but somewhere between 75 and 80% of Athens residents give the police departments their keys, the keys to their homes. Um, and they trust the police department with those keys. Uh, and I, I find that just a, a very strong signal of how the, how much the town the residents trust the the police um, and that's not just for vacation holds it's for lots of things but it's it's a very uh, um, impressive statistic that the police should take pride in um, i'd also say that that just on a personal note um, i've always taught 
my daughter, and I'm proud to teach her here in Atherton, that, you know, she's 11 years old now. If she's in trouble or she's lost, she should search out a police officer in uniform and, and you know, tell him, what's, tell him or her what's going on and, and look to get help from that person. Um, I still teach her that, and I think that is, that, that is something that I'm very comfortable teaching in, in, in the town of Aston with our police, that that's the proper thing to do. Um, and again, I, I think that's important for, um, in terms of at least my, my testimony about how the police are doing in Atherton, that's a, that, that's a big deal. But that's how I, I talk to my, my family about it. Um, with regard to the use of forest statistics, I found them sort of stunningly good um, and very helpful. The 55,000 responses with no uses of force is, is extraordinary. Um, I do think though that we should expect and the police should expect that our role as council members will lead to heightened scrutiny over the police officers in the next period of time. And that our oversight role will be helped enormously by data. I mean, data, 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 chief, whatever we can come up with that we can quantify how things are going. Um, very important to me personally. In terms of things I'd like to see us focus on as we move forward, um, maintaining high standards, particularly in hiring, seems very, very important. And I know we've done a good job with that, and I'd like to see us continue with that. Um, I also, the two specific issues I'd want to raise or things I want to keep our eye on as we, look, as we go forward. One is um, the use of body cams. And whenever I hear a story about an incident where something happened and a police officer's body cam wasn't on, my personal bias is that that's, that's the, at least gives the appearance of a cover-up or an attempted cover-up. And so it's really, really important. I don't think I'm unique in that. I think people get very cynical when they hear body cams are not on. We have them there. I'd like to see them used, you know, in every instance conceivable. I think it generally helps the officers, but whatever happens, it gives an accurate or more accurate uh, sense of what, what occurred during the incident. And finally, we talked a little bit about mutual aid requests. Um, I find it striking that we had had, you know, no incidents of use of force, and now we've had two through mutual aid requests in, in, in other jurisdictions. I think that creates, or those requests in, in extraordinary circumstances can present a dramatically heightened risk profile for the officer and, and uh, for the town, I'm not, I want to make sure that before we put an officer in that position, that, that, that we've been thoughtful about it, that the officer's trained to handle that, and that we are not setting people up for a problematic situation. Um, you know, shooting a, a 40 millimeter non-lethal object at a human being is a, is a risky thing to do. And it's not something that typically comes up in Atherton, obviously, going back to 1979. Um, so it, it, troubles me, I guess, that we are responding in, in that circumstance. I want to make sure, or at least I question every one of those responses, I want to make sure that we're being careful about it. So I think that can really cause a, a creates a potential for a real issue. Um, but having said that, again, I just, I'd, I'd close by saying that I think our police department does an, does an extraordinary job and has a lot to be uh, proud of. And, um, and Chief, I think, I think you've got a lot to be proud of and I look forward to continuing working with you on these issues. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll make a comment. I, the one thing, I, I first, um, Chief, I thought that you went through uh, these issues extremely thoroughly in your presentation. And I like it that you pulled in uh, the standards that have been established by President Obama and our other political leaders uh, and that, um, have been at the forefront of the debate over these last few weeks uh, since the Floyd killing. Um, I, I think that's uh, extremely appropriate and you were very thorough about it. I was surprised that each one of the points that have been raised publicly are already covered by the Lexapol um, policies and procedures. Um, and uh, I guess that makes me think, well, maybe, uh, you know, California promoting Lexapol is more uh, reform oriented than uh, some police departments and that these issues are raised for those other police departments. Uh, but I have a feeling that 
there is practice that doesn't uh, reflect the policies and procedures. And uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, in the course of our uh, going over uh, the presentation and, and the way that you were going to do it, we talked about how on one hand there's policy and procedure and on the other hand there's culture and practice and both are extremely important and one of the disconnects that that has occurred in many places is that difference between culture and practice and uh, policy and procedure and from from a city council level it's much easier for us to focus on policy and procedure and to totally rely on you to manage the culture and practice. But I do think we have responsibilities with respect to the culture. And, and I think given what everybody, all of the comments that we've heard, uh, that there's very strong feeling about uh, what is proper and what isn't. And I mean, we are in probably a, I know we're in a very fortunate situation that may be unique because it's a community policing environment where we're not dealing with the same kinds of issues that a, po a counterpart police officer would have to deal with in San Jose or even Redwood City. Um, and I just think we have to remain very cognizant of that culture and practice focus because it's hard for all of us to change our attitudes and to um, make sure that our culture and practice reflect our more easily established policies and procedures. Uh, and I'm glad that you're as focused on that as you are. I, I think maybe one thing we could ask for, uh, which has come up periodically in the discussion, is when you have the audit results from the body cam uh, or, or anywhere else that deals with some of these issues, if you would please, once you get that uh, result, give a report to the council. It's something that I think I can speak for the whole council that we're very interested in and would appreciate getting your report. Um, I think that also goes for the audits that we've talked about with the automated license plate readers to you and, and uh, informed as you get that information. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Well, I don't see other comments from the council. Unfortunately, council member Lewis had to leave. I'm sure she would have had comments. Uh, uh, if there are any further public comments, we'd be happy to entertain those now. This is a big and important subject and it's not going away. I do think that Atherton is extremely fortunate to have the type of police experience that we have, the type of force that we have, and to have ADAPT as closely integrated uh, and connected to the police force as they are. Uh, it really helps with the community connection. Uh, Greg, Rick, I'm sorry, one, if comment. I could, one point I uh, should have mentioned earlier is an overarching uh, comment, or maybe it's a question for you, Chief, to see if you would agree with the statement that um, sort of the civil liberties of our citizens and others require that we gather no more information than necessary to enforce the law. Is that, do you agree with that? That we should be trying to make sure we're not gathering information unnecessarily? Well, I agree with that. I think if you're referring to like intelligence or surveillance, uh, no, we only gather, you know, we're, we're typically called to a residence. Somebody needs help or service from our training and our standards and our procedures. You know, we gather the information that we need to do to thoroughly investigate what's before us and nothing more. Thanks. Uh, Greg, did you want to give a public comment? Well, I just, I just want to suggest that you 
work with your lawyer about the qualified immunity? Because I think right now Congress is locked up between the House and the Senate on that issue. That's one of the key issues. And I think it's going to be changed. And I think it's going to be to the detriment of the police. So I think that you, if you have a position that you'd want to argue uh, with the help of your counsel as to, uh, to keep up with that issue and make comments where you think it's appropriate to protect your own uh, beliefs and policies. So I'll leave you with that thought. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I think we're at the end of the agenda. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So second. Okay. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank okay. you all. Thank you, Chief. Thank you everybody. Doing good. Thank you. Thanks a lot.